This lecture is the first part of our lecture that covers the regulation of cardiac output and venous return. I am separating this lecture into three parts. The first part will be covering um, concepts such as uh, cardiac output, um, what controls cardiac output, and the role of metabolism in the regulation of cardiac output. The second part of the lecture will cover a special scenario in involving exercise and the role of the nervous system in control of both cardiac output and also maintaining blood pressure. The third part of the lecture, which will be a, again a separate webinar, is covering things that affect that, or factors that affect venous return and therefore affect cardiac output. So let's start with the first part of the lecture. We're going to start with a little overview, or a little review, I should say, more of a review of what we've done up to date. If you look at your picture, you'll have, you notice we have various things written on this um, diagram. Up here, these are different concepts that we've already discussed in previous lecture, but I want to kind of review with you is the role of changes in heart rate, the inotropic state of the heart, afterload and preload on the function of the heart. So if I ask you, if I increase heart rate, what do you expect to happen to cardiac output? And you should automatically say, well, Dr. Case, I learned this already. Cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. So I know if I increase heart rate, then my cardiac output should, be, should increase as long as my stroke volume has not gone down. The inotropic state of the heart, that's a, just a fancy term for talking about cardiac contractility. So if increased cardiac contractility, that increases stroke volume, which would increase cardiac output. Okay, so you could say, well, I've been there, done that, I already know that. Preload, another term for preload was end diastolic volume. So what was the role of changes in volume on cardiac output? If you remember Frank Starling, atrial stretch, the Bainbridge reflex, you'll ultimately figure out or remember that if I increase volume in those ventricles, I should get an increase in contractility and heart rate, which would influence cardiac output. And that's something that we're going to be kind of really zooming in on today is the role of preload on the regulation of cardiac output. So we're going to be looking at what factors determine the preload and thereby affect cardiac output. Now afterload also does play a role. Afterload is that literally means the load placed on the heart after it begins to contract. But what does that mean? That has to do with blood pressure, and specifically the pressure, in, if we're talking about the left ventricle, the left ventricle has to exceed your diastolic blood pressure to get the semilunar valve open and the blood out. If afterload is too high, it may impair stroke volume, which could decrease cardiac output. So we have discussed that in previous lectures. I will also want to remind you about the differences between the arterial circulation, which you see here is depicted in red, the venous circulation is depicted in blue, and the arterial system, I want you to think of it as being a resistance circulation, much higher resistance in the arterial system than in the venous system. It ha it's high resistance, so remember the pressures that the left ventricle have to achieve is much greater than the right ventricle because it has to work against higher resistance. Pressures, mean arterial pressure, that's a concept that we've already introduced to you. The mean arterial pressure is a major pressure for perfusion. So we have to, in the arterial system, that mean arterial pressure is higher for adequate perfusion. And we also discussed the, the role of changes in resistance in the system, in the um, circulatory system and effects on flow. So if I increase resistance, that could decrease flow. If I decrease resistance, that can increase flow. And we looked at local control of blood flow and how in what factors determine individual blood flows and in different um, individual 
I say organ or vascular beds. The over here on this side in the blue, the capacitance, we're talking about the venous system. Capacitance is just another word for capacity, for storage. So venous system is all about storage because I want to see if you remember what percent of, of your um, blood volume is found in the systemic venous system at rest. And you're going to say, oh, it's 64%. It gives you the idea it's a more of a storage type system. It's a low pressure, lower resistance circulation. But it also is going to play a very important role in when we talk about preload and the role of preload on cardiac output. So we have to know what factors are going to determine the amount of blood going back to the heart and it's going to be coming back through the veins. So if you affect venous return, you could affect ultimately what comes out of the heart. So this is kind of leading to what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to look at factors that determine venous return, which thereby affect cardiac output. Because you see this equation here, cardiac output should be equal to venous return. Not maybe for every individual heartbeat, but if you average a few heartbeats, that venous return should be equal to cardiac output. And I have up here, or else, or else what? If my venous return is greater than my cardiac output, blood is going to pool somewhere. So you must want, you really want to make sure that they're equal. So if the heart is failing, blood is going to start to pool in your systemic circulation. If, in, if we're, like if I'm saying like the right heart is failing, the right heart is failing, blood's not going to be pumped out of the right side of the heart, everything's going to start to back up. We could also affect the pulmonary circulation too. If the left heart starts to fail, blood's going to start backing up in the pulmonary circulation and lead to blood pooling, which could lead to edema. And you don't want edema in any part of the circulation if you can help it. So we do would like venous return to be equal to cardiac output. Now average resting cardiac output values, we're, we're averaging males and females together. It's about 5 liters per minute. And that's a number I've already made, made sure you memorize. Gentlemen, your cardiac outputs tend to be higher than the girls. It's about 5.6 liters per minute. Girls, you're about 4.5 liters per minute. So we just kind of average them together and we get about 5 liters per minute. Well, I'm going to make something a little bit easier for you. If you remember this first thing up here, cardiac output should be equal to venous return. If I ask you what is the average venous return at rest, you're going to say, well, if it's equal to cardiac output, I've already memorized 5 liters per minute. It's 5 liters per minute because venous return should be equal to cardiac output. And I'm giving you values at rest. So you should be able to figure out what should happen say if I'm exercising. Now there is a problem though with using values or cardiac output values if you want to compare different individuals. If you have a small individual versus a very large individual, individual you can't say well that small individual I'm going to tell you their cardiac output is probably going to be lower than that larger one but you're just like well that's abnormal. No, there is a relationship, strong relationship between body mass and body surface area and cardiac output. So you have to take in consideration differences when comparing cardiac output of different individuals. You have to take in consideration the correlation between body mass and body surface area. So I'm going to introduce to you a new concept called cardiac index. What you do to determine cardiac index is you take their cardiac output and you divide by their body surface area. You can go online, you can Google it, you put in your body size and all that and it will calculate your body surface area. So if you know your cardiac output, you know your body surface area, you can determine your cardiac, out, or sorry, cardiac index. This will be able, you'll be able to better compare two different sized individuals. So the number to remember, yeah, a number, 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 that came talk. Another number to remember is if I ask you what is the average cardiac index, you're going to say 3 liters per minute 
per square meter body surface area. So notice how they came up with their units. This is that units per cardiac output, liters per minute. The square meter is for the body surface area. How they came up with this number is the idea with a, um, and a healthy resting human adult. They say they're, they determine what their mean cardiac output was and, um, and then, then they compared with the body surface area. The average size individual is about 70 kilograms. They came, figured out the numbers and they ended up with about that three liters per minute per square meter. Now obviously this is going to be different for you and other people because your cardiac outputs may be different. Your body surface area obviously is different from this normal average human adult. So this is just the number I want you to remember. Now this cardiac index you're going to see it's going to show up in one of our later um, graphs. Now cardiac output is definitely related to your metabolism. It's proportional to your metabolism. So if you look at this picture, it's trying to depict the relationship between exercise, which you see on the x-axis, or work output. So if you go to the right, increased work, more strenuous exercise. On the y-axis on the left, that's depicting cardiac output. On the right is oxygen consumption. So let's just look at this left part. So if you notice that as exercise increases, as exercise increases, now that this red line here is representing the relationship between cardiac output and exercise, and the blue line is oxygen consumption with exercise. So let's just look at this, this line here. As work output increases, cardiac output increases. Most people would be like, yeah, I knew that. I didn't have to see. I didn't need to see a picture to, for you to tell me that. When I start working out, I know my cardiac output is going to increase because my body tissues are going to need more oxygen, more nutrients. They need to get rid of waste products. There is a direct, lin it's a linear relationship between work and cardiac output. Well, if you also notice the relationship between work output and oxygen consumption, it also is a direct relationship. So is the more is the work intensity increases, you're going to consume more oxygen. If you remember anything about biochemistry and its relationship between physiology and exercise physiology, you could say, well, I knew that too, because when I exercise, I need more oxygen to make ATP. It makes sense that as work output increases, I'm going to consume more oxygen. So cardiac output is definitely related to your metabolism. I'm going to call it the big M word. The big M word is metabolism. Guyton actually lists a number of things that influence your cardiac output and ultimately they're all linked to your metabolism one way, shape, or form. It's just saying it a different way. So I've listed some of the things that Guyton has actually listed. Your basal level metabolism. Well, yeah, you just told me about metabolism. So this is just like your BMR. Your basal level metabolism is directly linked to cardiac output. So the higher your basal metabolism, the higher the cardiac output. Your body size. The bigger you are, the higher the cardiac output. You have more tissues that you need to get blood and nutrients to. You're going to be making more metabolic byproducts. You just got, you're just bigger. Your cardiac output is going to be related to that. Your level of activity. In other words, I could say whether or not you're exercising. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize if I go from lying down, standing up, walking around, running, my exercise or my activity level is steadily increasing, I would expect my cardiac output to increase. So they're all linked somehow to your metabolism. Another one is age, and we're going to be looking, we're going to wait a moment and talk about that separately. Age also plays a role in your cardiac output. But before I look at that, let's look at the, st the things listed on the right. So you're going to have to take a few notes because I know this is not in your, your manual. But it kind of, I want you to kind of think of or putting together what I have already mentioned to you and linking it to something that you may be like, okay, what is the role of pregnancy? Or if I'm running a fever, what is that role in cardiac output? So 
whether you're asleep or awake, which of the two do you think the cardiac output is going to be greater? I hope you said, if I'm awake, my cardiac output is higher because you're sleeping, you're not doing much. Your activity level is not that great. So being awake, cardiac output is greater than while you're sleeping. Pregnancy. Pregnant women have higher cardiac outputs. Their metabolism is higher. And not that great, though, that pregnant women should get away with eating for two or three or four because they're going to gain weight otherwise. But their cardiac outputs are greater when you're pregnant. Overall metabolism is increased when you're pregnant. If you're running a fever, when you're running a fever, you're going to notice your heart rate tire. You actually, you ever remember mom, your mom saying, feed a fever, starve a cold? She wasn't lying. So when you, when you have a fever, your overall metabolism is higher. So in order to maintain your body mass, you will need to eat a little bit more. But most people, they don't feel very well, and they actually lose some weight if they're running a fever. Exercise, we've already mentioned about exercise. Exercise, obviously, the, the level of exercise, the more intense the exercise, the higher the levels of the cardiac output. Another one is your endocrine status. and We're just going to use your thyroid as an example. Your thyroid status definitely plays a role in metabolism. Thyroid hormones, T3, T4. T4 is also called thyroxine. T3 does also have a very long name, but I, don't, I tend not to use it. Those are very important metabolic hormones. If you're euthyroid, which is the one you see in the middle, that means you have normal thyroid hormone levels. If you are hypothyroid, you have below normal levels of thyroid hormone. And if you're hyperthyroid, you have higher than normal levels of thyroid hormones. Well, thyroid hormones play, definitely play a huge role in basal metabolism. The higher the thyroid hormones, the higher your metabolism. So if I'm hypothyroid, my metabolism is lower, my cardiac output is lower. If you're hyperthyroid, your metabolism is higher and your cardiac output is higher. This is a topic that we will be discussing also next trimester in Physiology 2 in the role of thyroid hormones in your metabolism. Now, age. So what is the role of age in metabolism and cardiac output? So let's just look at this graph. So this one is looking at your age and looking at cardiac index. So they have taken into consideration body surface error. So if you notice, now again, we're looking at something that's been averaged for the entire population. So we know we've got people that are going to fall outside these lines, but we're giving you an overall trend. So if you notice that your cardiac index, or I'm just going to say cardiac output, your cardiac output peaks about age 10. That's your peak cardiac output is at age 10. Everything goes downhill after that. So pretty much you've been downhill for most of you about at least 10 years. For a lot of you about 10 years. Me a little significantly more. So you peaked about age 10 and then cardiac output or cardiac index slowly declines thereafter. So why? Does our, like, my, why does my cardiac output continue to decline somewhat as I get older? Part of it is linked to changes in your metabolism. So if we average the population, we're averaging athletes and we're averaging couch, couch potatoes in the United States. Overall metabolism does decline as we get older because lots of it is we our activity levels decrease as we get older. Our levels of our maintenance of muscle declines because a lot of us are not as active. So and I make that statement, I mean your metabolism does decrease as you get older even if you are active, but how much that metabol metabolism decrease is dependent upon the individual. If you maintain your activity levels, Try to do activities that allow you to maintain muscle mass. The decline won't be as significant as in someone who does not, just sits around all the time, doesn't, is not active, does, does not do any kind of 
exercise to allow them to build muscle, their cardiac outputs are going to decline significantly. So how steep this line declines is dependent upon you and you alone. So here's another little uh, tidbit for you and for you to inform your patients is make sure they stay active. Maintaining activity is so important and also making sure you do things to help maintain muscle mass. Your metabolism will not change as much if you do that. And you're like, well, and it's not all about being skinny. You want to maintain cardiac output because if your cardiac output declines too much, your heart will not be able to do the job it needs to do is get the blood out to those tissues. There's a minimum cardiac output that you need and it, without it, you're going to be pretty much, I mean, pretty much they say about minimum you need is two liters per minute cardiac output for maintaining just baseline cardiac outputs and mean arterial pressure. So inevitably, if you don't maintain activity levels and muscle mass, cardiac output is going to can decline significantly. Other things that lead to decreases in cardiac output as we get older is structural changes over time. One of the things is the amount of muscle mass may decline as we get older as well as an increase in connective tissue. So without muscle, the heart's not going to be able to pump as effectively and you won't be able to maintain cardiac output. This would be obviously very significant in anybody who's suffered significant heart attacks and loss of muscle. But inevitably, we do kind of lose a little bit of muscle as we get older. It may not be significant in some people. We also have an increase in connective tissue as we get older. And now the connective tissue won't be able, is not contract out. It's going to make the heart stiffer. And I'm going to put this in here. I'm not going to answer it. But if you listen to this webinar, you'll be able to answer something I may ask you at a later point in time. So if I, if I say an increase in connective tissue in the heart would do what to compliance in the heart? So go back to things that we've talked about in the past. So increase in connective tissue means what to compliance. And so you have to remember that equation for compliance. So I'm not going to answer that, so that's your job to do. Now, I want to do is now look at how cardiac output is regulated. And you see the title of the slide, Regulation of Cardiac Output by Venus Return, because it is. Cardiac output is determined by your Venus Return. Arthur Guyton, who is the original author of the textbook, uh, Guyton's Medical Physiology, he is most famous for his work in the 1950s because he was a, a physiologist, or well he was a medical doctor, but he was a, did a lot of research, physiologist, who looked at the physiology of cardiac output and its relationship to the peripheral circulation. His research overturned the wisdom at the time that it was the heart that controlled the cardiac output. He showed it was the need of body tissues for oxygen and nutrients it was the body tissues that was the regular regulator of cardiac output and so it was factors in the peripheral circulation that controlled cardiac output not the heart so different things um, we're going to be looking at is the heart has built in a built-in mechanism that allows allows it to pump whatever you give it you give it the blood I'm going to pump it out doesn't not doesn't have to think about it. So under most normal conditions, the, the cardiac output is ultimately determ determined by factors that control venous return. So let's kind of look at some things that we've talked about in the past. And I'm going to somehow hopefully convince you it's not the heart that determines cardiac output. It's factors that determine the venous return. We have mentioned in the previous lecture, the intrinsic regulation of cardiac output, the innate. We've talked about Frank Starling mechanism of the heart. Frank Starling was the more in, more out rule. So 
it said that the greater the end diastolic volume, the greater the stroke volume. And what was the reasoning behind it? So if your venous return increases, more blood coming back to the heart, your end diastolic volume would increase. The heart stretches out more. More sarcomeres are going to interact. And then the force of contraction, the contractility, will increase, which would increase your stroke volume. So although what you have here, an increase in stroke volume, does lead to an increase in cardiac output, the big thing is, or big question is, what was the, what was the factor or factors that resulted in the increase in stroke volume? And it was the venous return. It was the return of the blood back to the heart. So what determined that level of venous return? So the heart just pumped out what you gave it. So ultimately what determined that increase in cardiac output was something that, that regulated venous return. Another couple things that we've talked about was atrial stretch. Now atrial stretch is also an example of intrinsic regulation of cardiac output. So I have kind of underlined those things that we talked about, the intrinsic regulation of cardiac output. So this is the heart in a Petri dish. So atrial stretch. So we, t we had mentioned that if you have an increase in volume, going back to the heart, and really the atria are going to stretch, eventually that blood's going to go into the ventricles. But the P cells, the pacemaker cells in the SA node, are going to depolarize at a faster rate and that's going to result in about a 10 to 15 percent increase in heart rate. So if you know the equation for cardiac output, you say, well, if an increase in heart rate would result in an increase in cardiac output, because heart rate and stroke volume are two factors that would increase cardiac output. Now, the Bainbridge reflex is not intrinsic regulation of cardiac output, so I didn't underline it. But Bainbridge reflex is mediated by the nervous system. Here, the Bainbridge reflex was also a response to increase in volume in the atria, but the increase in volume triggered sensory information going up to the vagus nerve, up to the vasomotor center, and reflexively, in its true nervous system reflex, triggered an increase in heart rate. And here is about a 40 to 60 percent increase in heart rate. So again, venous return controlled heart rate and controlled cardiac output. So if you have more blood coming back to the heart, you'll reflexively get an increase in heart rate. So again, the heart just did what you asked it to do. Someone else controlled what ultimately happened to that heart. So it's venous return that controls cardiac output. So this if you look at these two equations, which you do have to remember and always remember, even three years from now, if I ever see you, I'm going to ask you, what are the equations for this? I'm going to ask you that. Not that you'll ever see me again in three years, but you never know. Cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. Yeah, I've been there, done that. I know that. This equation kind of depicts the role of the, or the ability of the heart to affect cardiac output. If the heart can increase heart rate, it can increase stroke volume, it can increase cardiac output. So the pump will affect cardiac output. But the second equation really will help us look at the role of the periphery or peripheral control of cardiac output. Because ultimately, even though I have this equation, what determined this increase in heart rate and stroke volume. It was the venous return. It was peripheral factors. So the heart just is kind of a, it's passive. You give me what, you, you give me a certain amount of blood, I'll pump it out. So the bottom equation is even more important. Not that you need, don't forget the top one. This bottom one we have learned before. It was kind of a modified flow equation with cardiac out, output being total flow. That's equal to your mean arterial pressure divided by total peripheral resistance. Here, you have to, we're assuming that blood pressure regulation is normal, because it should. Blood pressure regulation is normal, so I'm going to ignore this. 
because we're assuming blood pressure regulation is normal. What is the role of resistance or changes of resistance on your cardiac output? What is the role of the peripheral circulation on cardiac output? Now remember, cardiac output is your total flow. It's the sum of all the local flows. So we'll say we got to flow to the to the lungs, flow to the kidneys, flow flow to the reproductive tract. All of these sum up and become your venous return that comes back up to the heart. That ultimately will become your cardiac output. So factors that affect the flows to these individual beds could determine your venous return and ultimately determine your cardiac output. So let's look at the effect of total peripheral resistance on your long-term regulation of cardiac output. So first scenario, and I don't have these written out, so I'll, I'll talk really slow so you can, you can write it out. If my, let's do the top, the bottom one, because that one's I like to talk about more, because I can use exercise as an example. So I'm exercising. My metabolism is going to increase. All right. So if my metabolism increases, what will be the effect on total peripheral resistance? We've got local control factors kicking in. If my metabolism increases, my total peripheral resistance will decrease. So write that down. Metabolism increases, total peripheral resistance will decrease. If you know the flow equation, you'll know what's going to happen to blood flow to those tissues. So if I decrease resistance, flow will increase to tissues. Okay, so we have an increased metabolism, leads to a decrease in total peripheral resistance, which increases flow to the tissues. All those individual blood flows sum up and become your venous return. So increased flow to tissues result in an increase in venous return, which will do what to your cardiac output? Increase it. So metabolism controls resistance. Resistance controls venous return and ultimately car your cardiac output. So what about a drop in metabolism? Instead of exercising, you're falling asleep in class or right now in the webinar. Hopefully you wake up. Could you fill in all what would happen? You should be able to just do this, this here but change all your arrows. Metabolism decreases. Total peripheral resistance will increase. This will result, result in a decreased flow to tissues, which would decrease venous return, which would decrease your cardiac output. So a key concept is the role of per, the peripheral circulation on venous return and its ultimate effect on cardiac output. So venous return determines your cardiac output. Now the last topic for this part of the webinar is we're going to be looking at a cardiac function curve. So before we look at the curve, I want to define these certain factors. So we're going to look at first the heart by itself no nervous system innervation, just intrinsic, um, the, the, the role of certain things on um, cardi or cardiac output, the heart by itself, its role in cardiac output, the heart by itself, no sympathetics, nothing. We'll look at the effects of the sympathetic stimulation. There can be various levels of sympathetic stimulation on cardiac output and ultimately something we're going to be looking at is right atrial pressure. We'll also look at a hyper-effective and a hypo-effective heart. So hyper-effective is more effective than normal. Hypo-effective is less effective. So a hyper-effective heart example would be uh, the role of hypertrophy and also kind of 
with that the, the role of sympathetics on the heart. So you would see a hyper effective heart definitely in someone who was an athlete, someone who was like a runner or a cyclist. Hypo effective heart would be someone that maybe had valvular disease or a congenital heart defect, some abnormal heart rhythm. Something is causing the heart not to work as an effective pump. So what we're going to be looking at when we look at a car, what we call a cardiac function curve. A cardiac function curve shows a relationship between right atrial pressure and cardiac output. So right atrial pressure, another term for right atrial pressure is central venous pressure. It's the pressure right there, right before it enters the heart. So right in those veins, the, the vena cava, right before you hit the right atrium. Even though I hate that term right atrial pressure because automatically you assume the pressure within the right atria. No. I like central venous pressure better, but you may right atrial pressure is often used. So it's the pressure right before it enters the heart. It's a very important pressure because I want to keep that pressure as low as possible because it would oppose blood coming back to the heart. It would oppose venous return which ultimately would affect your cardiac output. So let's look at this first picture just here. This one right here. I'm following it with my cursor with my mouse intrinsic so this is the heart no innervation it's a normal heart so at normal situations right atrial pressure should be zero millimeters of mercury okay so and cardiac output is five liters per minute so what would happen or what happens as cardiac output increases with this in, this normal heart well what you'll notice is I can increase cardiac output to a about maybe 13 liters per minute. It can get about two and a half times the normal amount before the heart does start become a limiting factor where then cardiac output could no longer increase. And you'll notice at this when you start getting up here, right atrial pressure starts to increase. So something's going on where I can increase my cardiac output to a certain extent before the heart can't really increase cardiac output as much. Something is resulting in right atrial pressure increasing which would start, start to, sorry, starting to oppose the return of blood back to the heart. So if I cannot increase my venous return I cannot increase my cardiac output. So somehow we're linking in the role of the right atrial pressure in venous return. If right atrial pressure increases too much, I cannot increase venous return, which thereby I cannot increase cardiac output. So the heart itself can increase cardiac output about two and a half times normal before it becomes a limiting factor. Okay, so what do we normally have to allow me to increase my cardiac output more? Because 15 liters per minute is not going to get me very far. So, normally, we have the role of the sympathetics. And we can, we have taken out a lot of the grass, but here's a certain amount of normal sympathetic stimulation, but I can increase this, have it go up even more, and even more, and even more. So, I want to look at the role of the sympathetics in allowing me to have higher cardiac outputs. So with an increase in sympathetics, you'll notice, I wish I had left more of the, the, the graphs on there. So we're starting here at zero. At this, I can increase cardiac output even a little bit more with, sympath uh, with sympathetic stimulation without right atrial pressure going up. And I can have more here, I can have various levels of sympathetics whereby I can increase my cardiac output because my right atrial pressure is not increasing. Cause that's, that's a big thing. If right atrial pressure increases too much, you will not be able to increase your venous return and therefore not increase your cardiac output. So what is happening is if right atrial pressure is increasing, 
it's showing you the role of the heart as being a limiting factor in increasing your cardiac output. So normally though, bringing more blood back to the heart, the, pump, the heart's going to pump it out. So we're going to need some sympathetics to be able to do that. But at some point, the heart will become a limiting factor and cannot pump out what you give it. So if I have increasing level of sympathetic stimulation, I can increase cardiac output because my right atrial pressure is not increasing. Okay, so I can pump that blood out. If I have a hyper-effective heart, I'm at that maximum level of sympathetic stimulation. Look at the levels of cardiac output I could get in, I can get, and my right atrial pressure is not changing that much. So with a hyper-effective heart, I've got max sympathetic stimulation, plus I also have hypertrophy to an extent. So um, the kind of two things that can make the heart pump better than normal would be nervous stimulation, and specifically sympathetic nervous system stimulation, and hypertrophy. So I can make that heart more effective, and I can increase my cardiac outputs. Now down here, hypoeffective heart. So you look at a hypoeffective heart. Notice if my heart is less effective to make to have look at to have the same level of cardiac output if I'm at zero millimeters of mercury I don't have a cardiac output what we have here with a hypoeffective heart is what you will always associate with a hypoeffective heart is higher than normal right atrial pressures and the inability to get decent cardiac outputs or be able to increase the cardiac outputs because something is making the heart less effective. The heart definitely is a limiting factor in regulation of cardiac output because it cannot pump what you're asking it to do. So overall what I'm trying to get from this, this cardiac function curve is the heart can be a limiting factor in cardiac output if it's not being able to work like it should. Under normal conditions, it isn't a limiting factor. It's whatever you give it, give it, it will pump it out because we have roles of the sympathetic stimulation. We do, in some extent, with training, get some hypertrophy, but the heart can become a limiting factor in the regulation of cardiac output. So something is causing the heart not to be as effective. Right atrial pressures are increasing and opposing the return of blood back to the heart. So you notice my cardiac outputs aren't getting very high here. This line right here showing the minimum level of output you need just to maintain baseline metabolism. And here, if you have minimum output, you're just laying in bed. You're not really doing anything. So what type of things could make the heart hypoeffective and lead to the heart being a limiting factor in the regulation of cardiac output? So it could be things, again, like valvular defects, um, hypertension, high blood pressure over time can make the heart not work as effective. Congenital heart defects, like septal defects, could be one, um, like a ventricular septal defect. Uh, abnormal heart rhythms, some of the arrhythmias that we talked about can make the heart less effective and lead to diminished cardiac outputs. So kind of big picture stuff I want you, this to me I think is the hardest part of the first part of the lecture is kind of putting your, your head around what we're trying to show you with this cardiac function curve. What I'm trying to depict or show you is that even though I have said that normal circumstances the factors that control cardiac output would be factors that control venous return. The heart normally plays a very permissive role in the regulation of cardiac output. But if the returning blood becomes more than the heart can handle, can pump, the heart will become a limiting factor to determine cardiac output. Normal conditions, we have sympathetics that help us get that blood out.
so we can get higher than normal cardiac outputs, more than the heart can normally handle. You have the effects of hypertrophy. Hypertrophy in max sympathetic stimulation will make the heart very hyper effective and this will lead to really high cardiac outputs. The highest cardiac outputs that I think they've measured are about 40 liters per minute. Now that is, you don't get that in a lot of people, but those are being in some of the, the elite cyclists and the elite marathon runners can get to those 40 liters per minute. And they have talked about it, and it does talk about it a little bit in your textbook, is the level of the max cardiac output that you can get determines your running time. So if you're a runner, it will really determine your running time. If you can get to 40 liters per minute, you're going to beat out anybody that is less than that. So if you only get 20 liters per minute, there's no way you're going to be anywhere in the ballpark of someone who can get up to 40 liters per minute because they can get the oxygen, the nutrients, get rid of the waste products a heck of a lot better than someone who can only get up to 20 liters per minute. So that will determine your running times or in the times you're, if you're a cyclist, the times that you can get for a particular distance. If you, your heart is less effective, definitely heart becomes a limiting factor in cardiac output. Your level of venous return coming in the heart, it cannot pump it out and it cannot increase cardiac output. So the heart is not pumping what you give it. So the heart definitely would become a limiting factor if the heart it becomes less effective. So this is the last slide for the first part of the lecture on the regulation of cardiac output and venous return.